Welcome. We're back with another exciting episode of Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. Indeed. Let's get started with a new supercar kit from Tamiya. A 124th scale Gordon Murray Automotive T50. Gordon Murray designed Formula One cars in the 1970s and 80s before going to work at McLaren. There, his designs included the iconic F1 supercar. The T50 was the first car at the company he founded in 2017, and all 100 production variants sold for almost $3 million each in two days. Needless to say, at just $60, this is the only way I'm going to afford one of these. Me too. This is not a curbside kit, and the Cosworth V12 engine has a block with transmission, heads, exhausts, mounts, cooling systems, and more. The suspension builds from multiple parts, and there are slide molded springs, multiple part brakes, and beautifully molded wheels for the sharp low profile tires. The underside is molded in sections with the ducting for the ground effect system. The T50's unique body required a unique approach with the black frame, part of which becomes the canopy, to which is mounted the nose, doors, rear fenders, engine covers, and the distinctive rear bumper with its fan opening. Photo etched metal is supplied to fill openings in the rear. There are separate parts for the window frames and upper duct. Inside the cabin, the passenger bucket seats sit slightly behind on either side of the center mounted driver's seat. With the beam mounted shifters, dash, and instrument cluster with steering and controls. The windows are all designed to click into place without glue. Clear plastic also supplies light lenses and covers. Optional clear parts allow the engine covers to be exchanged to pose them open or closed. Mirror stickers provide badging for the car and engine and reflectors for the taillights. On the decal sheet are wheel hub and body logos, internal labeling and trim, branding for the brakes, and dials and displays for the dash. This kit is another Tamiya Tour de Force packed with detail and smart engineering. Painting will be key to finishing this one, not only the body but all the detail. Now here's something small but graceful. From Italy, a 172nd scale CR32 Freccia. Dating to the early 1930s, the Fiat biplane was reliable, maneuverable, and armed with a pair of 12.7 millimeter machine guns. The aircraft proved itself in service of the nationalist forces in the Spanish Civil War. Although obsolete by the outbreak of World War II, a number saw combat in North Africa. This kit originated as a supermodel offering in 1973, but still looks okay with recessed panel lines on metal areas. Fabric covered areas like the rear fuselage and wings have exaggerated cloth texture. The nose has venting and louvers. Interior detail includes framing molded into the fuselage, floor, seat, and controls. The landing gear spats fit full wheels, and the inner plane and cabane struts are pretty thin. Clear plastic supplies the windshield and in a throwback to when the kit was new, a stand. Cartograph decals provide markings for five aircraft. A camouflage Regia Aeronautica fighter in 1935, an aluminum dope and camouflaged Italian plane in 1938, a Spanish Civil War fighter in 1936, a World War II plane in typical splotchy camo in 1940, and a Hungarian trainer in 1942. Despite its age, this is still a decent kit and it should build nicely. And since the original thing had minimal rigging, it would make a good first small-scale biplane kit. Sticking with 172nd scale, we have the latest superb offering from Arma. A P-39N, the first mass-produced version of Bell's fighter. We looked at Arma's initial era Cobra, the P-39Q, in a previous video. You can see that video and Mike Klessig's workbench review of it at a link in the description. The parts here are identical, so let's look at what's new, the decals. The tech mod sheet gives options for three aircraft, a Soviet Len lease plane from the 100th Guards Fighter Regiment, an awesome shark mouth wearing American 345th Fighter Squadron bird in Sardinia, Corsica in 1944, and a French plane in Algeria in 1944. Bonus decals provide optional marking for the Soviet plane. Another quality release from Arma that should land on many a workbench. From Osprey, here are three interesting books. Starting with Stephen Zaloga's Tanks in Operation Bagration, 1944, The Demolition of Army Group Center. Volume 318 in the new Vanguard series, the 48-page softcover, details the Red Army's overwhelming defeat of the German Army in Belarusa and the role new Russian tanks played. We have another new Vanguard title, number 319, British Frigates and Escort Destroyers, 1939-45. to 45. 
In this 48-page softcover, Angus Constum covers Hunt Class Escort Destroyers and River, Lock, and Bay Class Frigates in development and service. Sticking with maritime subjects is Warship 2023, edited by John Jordan. This 224-page hardcover details a wide variety of naval subjects from French aircraft carriers, Italian battleships, German flagships, and modern U.S. Navy operations in the Pacific. Sweden-based Scania is one of Europe's top heavy truck manufacturers. This is an Alaris 124th scale kit of the S770 4x2 normal roof tractor. Launched in 2016, the S-Series is the highest cab made by Scania and features advanced safety systems. It includes a pretty complete V8 diesel engine with the block, heads, belts and fan, turbocharging system, radiator, air filter and exhaust. It fits into the frame with steerable front suspension and rear axle and springs as well as tanks and cylinders. Well molded but unbranded tires wrap multi-part rims. The cab interior includes mats molded on the floor, rear with bunk and sides with integrated storage, seats with separate armrests, inner door panels, and a nicely detailed dash and console. Even the ceiling is well detailed. Molded in startling blue, the body comprises separate front sections, including the distinctive grille, sides, rear and roof, wheel arches, and the aerodynamic skirts and fairings. The doors can be cut apart to be posed open. The radiator cover can be posed too. The door windows go in from the inside, but the windshield and sunroof fit from outside. Lights are also provided in clear plastic. Self-adhesive foil supplies mirrors and the chrome trim and manufacturer name on the front. There's photo etched brass here too, with the grills for the radiator openings, seat belts, and badging. Cartograph decals give more badges, displays for the dash, the flashy graphics for the body, and license plates for 15 countries. Italeri is one of the few companies producing models of modern trucks, and this one looks like a winner. It'll have you going. Let's wrap up this week with a couple of figure sets from ICM. First, a set designed to be used with ICM's Beaufort or another British bomber, 148th scale RAF bomber and torpedo pilots, 1939 to 1945. Actually, three of the five figures are aircrew with flight jackets, insulated boots, and other equipment. The other two are ground crew in poses to work around the torpedo and cart included with the Beaufort. The moldings show good uniform and equipment details. The other set comes from ICM's Brave Ukraine series, 135th scale journalists at war. It includes a Ukrainian soldier being interviewed by a TV reporter and her videographer. A still photojournalist rounds out the set. All of the figures wear body armor and the journos wear helmets. The soldier is given a choice of AK-74s with and without grenade launchers, and the cameras and microphone are separate. Both sets offer options for displaying completed models. Absolutely. Look for reviews of the T-50, CR-32, and Scania at FineScale.com. Which is a great place to look at how-to articles, snapshots, peruse show galleries, more videos, and lots of other content. While you're there, head to CombatHobbyStore.com for these out-of-this-world Hanes manuals that will help launch your next project. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly is brought to you by HobbyZone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. So a few weeks back, we put in a 3D printing station in the FSM workshop, and we promised you that we would give you occasional updates on what we were doing with the 3D printer. First of all, we had to take a deep dive into learning about the 3D printer, which was not only looking at, you know, information that the company that made our printer, Anycubic, had on their website, but just a ton of other information that's out there about how to do 3D printing and do it fairly well. <laughs> so that's what we've been spending a lot of our time doing. And then calibrating the machine. So calibrating, we found out is a big deal with making sure that your prints are successful. And there are a number of different calibration tools out there. The one that we decided upon was something called the cones of calibration. You can see right here, it is put out by a company called Table Flip Foundry. And so the cones of calibration, it prints up this little piece here and on the fail side, 
All these cones are supposed to fail. They're not supposed to touch. But on the success side, what you're supposed to have are cones that do go ahead and touch in the middle. And you can see when we had the, the exposure set to 2.5, well, we were not getting this fifth and final cone to, to print fully. So adjusting the exposure to 3.5, we went ahead and printed again. And lo and behold, we got all of the cones to go ahead and print. But words on top of the cones of calibration, the table flip foundry, letters were mm, not quite as sharp as they had been at 2.5. So we went ahead and backed off a little bit on the calibration to 3.25. And guess what? We had all of those cones print and we were able to sharpen up the table flip foundry letters on top. So we decided for now, that's gonna be good enough for us. Let's go ahead at, with the exposure at 3.25 and print. Next, we need an STL file. I designed a figure with Hero Forge. I based this figure off of an illustration, a painting that Aaron and I are using as inspiration for a diorama that we're working on that eh, you'll see in another video pretty shortly. In any case, this is where I designed the figure. I went ahead then and downloaded the STL generated from this and imported it into Lychee. You can see that I put three different versions of the fig in lychee and position them at three different angles. One that is almost vertical, one that's at 45 degrees, and one that's more or less at 70 degrees, 60, 70 degrees, just because I wanted to see which one would print the best. Then after they were positioned, I went ahead and prepared them by using both the auto and manual options to place supports. Now you're gonna see that when I move to export the, the files, that the first one, it says like it's got six islands in there. I had already corrected manually six other ones and I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and export this thing and we'll see what happens. Here are the three figures as they came out of the, the printer. Now obviously, I washed them with alcohol, 91% alcohol, and then they went through the, the UV lighting treatment, right, to harden all of the resin. But after that, that's what these, uh, these figures came out and looked like. The best of the three is this center one here with the 45 degree angle. It has one hand that's just a little bit soft on detail that the 70 degree angle one was better on, but overall, this one has the best detail of the three. You can see that the base on this one that had an overhang, it didn't print nearly as well as it should have, and that was, again, one of those, one of those six island things that I decided, ah, I'm just gonna forget about it and print it. So that's what happened when I went ahead and said, whatevs. All that's really left right now is to clip off the supports and see what it looks like. Oh, no. we lost a hand. We lost a hand. Look at what I did there. Oh my, this is a learning lesson right there. Somebody out there was was screaming at their screen as I was doing that, going, don't cut it there. Don't do it, man. And then what happened? I lost her, her hand. Now, that hand actually is better printed on the 70 degree one, so maybe I'll just go ahead and... <clears throat> Replace her hand. She's a little Luke Skywalker action there. Holy cow. No, well, let's keep going. <laughs> let's see how a razor saw works on this, this closer situation I've got going on here.
Oof. Stressful. So after all of that, snipping away, yeah, she's there. There's gonna be some cleanup that needs to be done and maybe I didn't do the best job with the supports. Maybe I could have been uh, cleaner when putting those supports in. That obviously will come with experience, but for our first print, I don't think she looks too bad, obviously. Again, I'm gonna have to replace that at hand. Although, really, I mean, I could just go to the printer and print her again. <laughs> so, in any case, that's where we're at right now with the 3D printer. It's fun, it's a neat tool, and you're gonna be seeing us doing a lot more with it in the future. Don't forget to enter the Fine Scale Modeler June Sweeps for your chance to win $1,000 worth of kits from the likes of Tamiya, Airfix, Revell, ICM, and Atlantis. Go to finescale.com slash June Sweeps to enter now. So we are already working on the January, February 2024 issue of Fine Scale Modeler Magazine. So six months in the future. Yes, yeah. So we're already working on it, and that's going to be a, our big issue for the year, 76 pages. Yep. And the theme for that issue is paint. Yep. Paint and painting. Paint and painting. Specifically, the fact that there are so many brands of paint now, it seems like every month we have a new brand coming out or one of the existing brands is coming up with a new line of paints within that brand. Uh, there are four basic kinds of five. Paint. There are five, five, right? So watercolor sure. and then acrylics, yep. uh, oil paints, yep. lacquers yep. and enamels. Yes. And we use all five of those in, in one, modeling in, in one, one form, form or another. Or right. So we're gonna try and cover a little bit of all of that. Lots of features focused on that. Right. So what we wanted to do is as we are preparing to work on that issue, we wanted to open it up to you and see if there's anything, any questions that you might have that you would like for us to answer in that issue. Specifically about paint. Questions paint. about paint. Yeah, <laughs> questions about paint. Let's, let's, let's keep it about paint, guys. Yes. I mean, <laughs> The land speed of a cheetah is 54 miles an hour, but that's not really... No, you will be fact-checked on that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's keep it about, let's keep it about paint and if, uh, for the time being. And if you have one of those questions, you can email us at questions at finescale.com or leave them leave in the them, comments below. Leave them in the comments below. If you're watching it on the website, again, you know, if you're already watching it on finescale.com, leave them in the comments below the below the video there, and we will read them and we will get to them. And if we can't answer those questions for you, we will definitely find the person who can. Yep. So thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. Bye. It's phonetic. Gordon Murray. 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 Sorry. Gordon Murray designed Formula One cars in the 1970s and 80s before going to work at McLaren. I can't smile like this anymore. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say Americana. I don't know why. There's no Americano. A. These are books. Go get them. <laughs> the highest cab, man. Yeah. <laughs> And I forgot the rest. Mats, mats, mats. New product rundown, mosh pit. <laughs> fight jackets. Fight First rule jackets. of fight jacket, never discuss fight jacket. <laughs> okay. Okay. Got to move it, move it. It's the final outro. <laughs> and more videos and lots of other stuff. <laughs>